Today we are going to the book of Genesis chapter 35 from verse 6 to verse 15. The book of Genesis chapter 35 from verse 6 to verse 15 and the topic today is acceptance in the promise of God. So starting verse 6. Jacob and all the people with him came to Luz, that is Bethel, in the land of Canaan. There he built an altar, and he called the place El Bethel, because it was there that God revealed himself to him when he was fleeing from his brother. Now Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died and was buried under the oak outside Bethel. So it was named Al Alon Bakuf. After Jacob returned from Padam Aram, God appeared to him again and blessed him. God said to him, Your name is Jacob, but you will no longer be called Jacob. Your name will be Israel. So he named him Israel. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and increase in number. A nation and a community of nations will come from you and kings will be among your descendants. The land I gave to Abraham and Isaac I also give to you, and I will give this land to your descendants after you. Then God went up from him at the place where he had talked with him. Jacob set up a stone pillar at the place where God had talked with him, and he poured out a drink offering on it. He also poured oil on it. Jacob called the place where God had talked with him, Bethel. So have you ever been to a familiar place in your life and all the memories in the past just flood your mind? Everything about that place was special to you. The trees in the park, or the walking path that led up to the mountain, or the birds singing along the tree lines remind you of your childhood memory with your parents, or the sidewalk that you walk with your pets every single day. You don't have to force yourself to remember all these things. The memories will just come back to you whenever you visit that particular place. And to Jacob, that place was Bethel. His journey with God started at that place. The original plan was just a few days as Rebecca, his mother, had hoped for. Yet days turned into months, months to years, and after Jacob's 20 plus years journey back to Bethel from his uncle Laban's place and how God intervened for him, he finally was back to Bethel. As simple as verse 6 to 8 are, they signify the completion of Jacob's journey. They carry the significant meaning to Jacob that he was fleeing his brother because of his wrongdoing and how God had turned the hostile relationships with his brother back into harmony. When he built an altar there, it emphasized the fact that God had fulfilled his promise to Jacob in this journey and Jacob now fulfilled his vow unto God about how he will follow God for the rest of his life. So Christians, when we look back to our lives, we will come to a lot of places just like Bethel to Jacob. We realize how God has always been faithful unto his promise to us and how many times we fail to trust God even with his promises in our lives. But every turn of our lives, God was able to direct us and bless us along the way. So I surely hope that we recognize those events and keep on thinking them every time that we started to doubt God, whether he is here or whether he listened to our prayer or whether he cares or loves us. I hope these events will just like your childhood events that, you know, every time you pass by those places, the memory will just come back to you, remind you how much love you share with your family. And so this event will remind you how much God cares for you and loves you. But then sometimes it will also be like in verse 8, 
Now Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, died and was buried under the oak below Bethel, so it was named Alon Bakuth. Not every life event we look back was joyful. And here we saw that Deborah, Rebe Rebecca's nurse, passed away. It may be a little surprising to you that instead of re recording Rebecca's death, it was her nurse's death being recorded here. To me, it might be an expression to subtly imply the helplessness of Jacob regarding to the passing of his own mother, Rebecca. When Rebecca passed away, Jacob was not there with her. He was at his uncle's place because he was fleeing from his own brother Esau. The sad fact that plans did not go according to what Rebecca and Jacob wanted it to be, and it also tells us that sometimes there is simply nothing we can do to alter the consequences of these decisions in our lives. It may sound helpless to you, and you may think that there would be some Christian's cliche that I'm going to lighten up the case here. To be honest, there is no cliche to say here, nor will I sugarcoat what is clearly indicating in this particular passage right here. I won't say because God is here and God bless Jacob's journey and that, you know, God bless Jacob with all the things that he had right now, everything is all right. No, it's not the case. To Jacob, even if he knew that God was always there for him and that everything that he had today was from God, the fact that his, when his mother passed away and he wasn't there for her is real unto Jacob. It is truly a sad fact for Jacob to face in his life that he wasn't there for his beloved mother when the time she was about to pass away. So as real as the blessings were from God to Jacob, so were the negative events in his life too. Sometimes I think Christians quickly dismiss the negative events that happen in our lives because we say that we should be rejoicing in the grace of God all the time. That if we are satisfied in God, there shouldn't be anything that we are sad in this life. No, that's not life and that's not what the Bible portrays life is. And to, to just rejoicing in the grace of God all the time and thinking that, you know, no negative event should be bothering us is just a way to deny our emotions towards the negative events in our lives. Rejecting the negative events that took place will not help anyone to get past them because those things are real. And we got to admit that they are real in our lives. And as bad as it sounds, we need to recognize that they actually happen. For Jacob to, you know, so-called rejoice in the grace of God and in the blessings of God and ignore or even reject the fact that his mother passed away and he wasn't even there will not help anything because it actually happened that way. And at the same time, running away will not help us to grow, will not help us to ignore these things, because running away will only worsen the guilt, the shame, and the pain that we feel inside of us. Look at Jacob, running away for 20 plus years. 20 plus years. And it did not alter the fact that he was not there for his mother when his mother passed away. So what good did that running away do? So the way for us to face our emotions, to accept these negative events, is to ask ourselves this question. Do we accept the fact that we are not perfect? 
Do we accept the fact that we are not perfect? And do we accept the fact that we are not God? Do we recognize that no matter how perfect I want my decision to be, it will fall short of what perfect is, no matter what? Do we accept that we have flaws in our lives that none of us can get rid of them by ourselves or by any human forces? To accept that we have shortcomings that can lead up to negative events with negative consequences in our lives is how we face these negative events. This is very important because to recognize this will help us to also recognize one thing that is missing in our life that we actually need in our life. And that is we need the perfect God to help us to be strong in facing every event in our lives. Sometimes we receive the forgiveness of God through our faith in Jesus Christ, but somehow, somehow, we did not forgive ourselves for the things we did wrong in the past. And what happened there is that we allow our past to linger into our lives in Christ. And so every step of the way, we kind of look back into the past, remembering what we did wrong and remind ourselves the shame and the guilt and the negative consequences of the negative events that happened in the past to stop us from moving forward. So we went back to our own battle Instead of remembering how God delivered us time and time again, we remember how stupid we were to do such a stupid mistake in the past. Or that how idiotic for me to make such a decision that led up to more negativities in my life. We did not build an altar to worship God as Jacob did in Bethel. We, in our own battles, scolded ourselves and we judged ourselves way more than God did. The worst is that we accepted and believed in all this scolding and judgment from ourselves upon ourselves. But let us remind ourselves one very important truth from the Bible. Okay, Jesus died for us when we were still sinners. You probably heard this tons of times, but what does it actually mean when I say Jesus died for us when we were still sinners? What I'm trying to draw from this truth is that God wants us to be saved in him than to be judged by him. Let me say that one more time. God wants us to be saved in him than to be judged by him. We are always under the wrong impression that God wants to judge us. God is quick to judge us. But this is the misconception regarding to God. The truth is that God would much rather save us than to judge us. God would much rather save us from sins and death than to judge us and send us into eternity damnation. So what you need to understand is that if God does not prefer to judge us, why should we continue to judge ourselves and not face the truth that we are not perfect? As soon as you understand this, will you be able to free yourself from the bondage you had created for yourself. Just like Jacob, God helped him in a way that you may not realize before that it actually is related to what I'm preaching right here. Look at a couple more verses and you will see one thing that God did for Jacob. God changed Jacob's name and God reinforced Jacob's new name here. So look at verse 9 and verse 10 again. 
After Jacob returned from Padam Aram, God appeared to him again and blessed him. God said to him, "Your name is Jacob, but you will no longer be called Jacob. Your name will be Israel." So he named him Israel. God once again reaffirmed Jacob that you will no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. Why? Because the old life is past, and in God, Jacob now has the new life, and you and he will continue living this new life as Israel, but not Jacob anymore. You see, God allowed Jacob to face his past and help him to accept the fact that he was not perfect. God did a、uh, uh, Jacob did. A lot of things wrong, and suffer from the consequences.、Uh, that includes a lot. Okay, he completely destroyed the family dynamics between his father and mother, and to his brother, everyone. He suffered from、uh, Laban's treatment in that fourteen years and plus six to seven years, and that he had to worry to meet his own brother again. And right here in this chapter, you see that his mother passed away during his journey, fleeing from his own brother. So Jacob suffered from all those consequences of his life events. And same goes to you. You did things wrong. You suffer from those consequences, and they are real consequences, leading to real suffering. Leading to real emotions and leading to real regrets in life. Don't worry, everyone has that. But the more important truth right here is that God did not allow Jacob to continue dwelling in these shames, guilts, and self judgments. God reminded Jacob that right now you are living this new life as. Israel, you are no longer under judgment, but right now you are in the grace of God. So, God did that to Jacob, and so God will do the same for you. If God does not judge you, why should you judge yourself? If God accepted you. As who you are, meaning accepting you with shortcoming, with flaws, with intention of still sinning against him after you believe in him, and knowing all this, and God still accepts you in His grace. God still do this for you. So right now the question is: Will you accept yourself as how God sees you? And now you can repent in His grace and mercy with the power of the Holy Spirit. So will you accept yourself, just as how God accept you to begin with? So stop judging yourself. Stop being harsh on your flaws and shortcoming. Stop beating yourself up because of whatever stupid decisions that you have made in the past. Remember Second Corinthians chapter five verse seventeen. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone; the new has come. So now you have a decision to make. God forgave you already. Will you forgive yourselves of the things that you did wrong in the past? Will you free yourself of your own standard of for- of forgiveness? And accept God's salvation in your life. Your faith in Jesus Christ brings acceptance of God in your life. So will you now accept yourself as God had accepted you and gave you a new life in His Son? And from verse eleven to verse thirteen, read again. And God said to him, "I am God Almighty." Be fruitful and increase in number. 
a nation and a community of nations will come from you, and kings will come from your body. The land I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I also give to you, and I will give this land to your descendants after you. Then God went up from him at the place where he had talked with him. Now, this is the blessing that Jacob wanted to inherit from his father Isaac twenty plus years ago, but he thought he would inherit it from his father by cheating. But he didn't realize this blessing was actually from God. Ironic, right? All that Jacob was seeking long ago was in God all along. So this is a great reflection right here. That is, how often did we try to get the blessings we long for from our own strength, and at the same time not identify God as the source of all our blessings? How often do we try all our ways to obtain the things that we think we want, but forgot to ask God that, God, can you determine whether I'm ready to receive this blessing in my life? So, do you believe that God is the one where all blessings flow? And again, look at the promise again. Whatever God promised unto Abraham and Isaac. He also gave to Jacob, not lacking anything, not deducting anything. But then it must mean more to Jacob. Read again. God said, "I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and increase in number." If you were Jacob, you probably heard stories about how your grandfather and grandmother Abraham and Sarah. Were not able to give birth to any children on their own, but then God blessed Sarah one son, and that is Isaac, your father. And how your father and your mother Isaac and Rebecca also could not give birth, until God blessed Rebecca with the twins, and here you are, Jacob. How powerful that is in Jacob's mind. God is truly the Almighty. Because he has the life to give to those who are impossible to give birth, and going back to today's time frame, and from all the technological and medical advancement we have today, okay, we still would not be able to resolve the problem of you know women being barren. But in God, you know, looking at the context of these two verses. In God, not only one generation, but two generations come from Him, and now His blessing is that nations will continue to come from Jacob. Of course, today I'm not saying that God will help with all the barren family to be able to give birth on their own, but I'm saying that God is not only faithful unto His promises. But also Almighty to fulfill them. I find that sometime we omit the fact that being faithful also imply that God has the might and the power to fulfill what He says. And we may not experience the same thing as Jacob did in his life, but our experience in God. Should include our belief in God that He is the Almighty God. But sometimes this phrase, this term, the Almighty God, we may listen to it a thousand times at church, and you also sing praises with this term as well for, I don't know how many times, probably a tons of time. But my question is that, how real? Is this truth in your life? How practical this truth is in your everyday Christian life. Do you recognize that God is the Almighty God that no one can go against Him? No authority is more powerful than His. So if you are in His will, following His teaching in your life, 
having fellowship in His Word with His people, there shouldn't be anything for you to worry about, simply because He is the Almighty God. Whatever He says, He is faithful and powerful to fulfill them. Whatever He promises in His words, He is faithful and powerful to uphold them. And I hope this will strengthen your faith in His word. And at the same time, God reminded Jacob that He will give this land to Jacob and to his descendants. And to us, this may be like a, you know just repeating Abra Abraham's covenant unto Jacob. So, what's important here? But then you may forget what happened. In the last chapter, especially the closing of the last chapter, because this promise, this repeating promise unto Jacob at this moment in his life, is vital and encouraging. At the same time, look back to the closing of the last chapter. Jacob was worried that because of what his sons did. In the city of Shechem, unto Shechem and all the people there, his family would be wiped out by the people in Canaan. But God sent His fear to the people around them, so that no one pursued Jacob and his family. And now God reaffirmed this promise to Jacob that not only will no one harm you and your family. But from you will come nations. From you will come kings, and God will give this land to Jacob and to his descendants. So what God says here should completely eliminate whatever worries Jacob had in his mind at that time, and in return, filling his heart and his mind with God's promise and God's peace. And now, Christian, this is what the promise of God brings into our lives. His promise will always take out our fear, our worries, our doubts, and in return, fill us with His blessing, His word, His promise, His joy, and His peace. So, if you find yourself worried about life, anxious of the unknown. Doubt if things will go well according to your plan. Let me suggest that you should go back to the Word of God, and allow yourself to calm down in the grace of God. I have found nothing that will calm the storm in our heart and mind but the Word of God. There is no self-help book or motivational speech that can calm our worrying minds. And lead us to the perfect peace that only God can offer. In every generations in human history, there will be different things for us to worry, for us to be unsettled, for us to feel insecure and not in control. Today, we are facing our own generation problems. We have pandemic. We have politics unease, injustice. And the list goes on and on and on. However, in the midst of all these issues, all these negative events in our lives, do we remember the promise of God and allow ourselves to dwell in the Almighty God? What I mean is that do we believe in God's faithfulness and His power to fulfill His promise during the most difficult times of our lives? Or do we depend on our own strength to hopefully find the blessings or the good things we want in life? Jacob in here served as the perfect example for us to reflect on. He utilized all that he had to get his blessings from his father, but ended up he was not even able to be with his mother in her last moment. But in obedience unto God's command in this chapter, and you see that God gave him 
his blessings. With his own life experience to back up God's promise, Jacob now received a new life from God and dwelt in peace with God and with his brother Esau, who once wanted to kill him. So in comparison, which way is better? And which way are you going to choose today? And at last, we come to the last two verses of today's sermon. Jacob set up a stone pillar at the place where God had talked with him. And he poured out a drink offering on it. He also poured oil on it. Jacob called the place where God had talked with him Bethel. His action here is the fulfillment of, it, of his vow back in chapter 28, verse 20 to verse 22. It says, If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house and of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. It may not seem anything important to say on this couple of verse or anything to preach on, but on the contrary, this is the most important thing Christians need to recognize. You should fulfill the promise you made unto God and men. Let me repeat, you should fulfill the promise you made unto God and men. As we just reflect on God's faithfulness and his power to back up all his promise, and that Christians should also reflect the likeness of God, likeness of Christ in our lives, we should remember what we promised and fulfill them. This is probably something we did not pay much attention to, which is the things that we say every single day. Do not treat our words lightly as God is always listening and why make God upset by our foolishness in making false promises. Meanwhile, why keep on saying things to other people when we have absolutely no intention in doing them? There is a saying, talk is cheap, right? But I disagree with it. Talk is expensive because it reveals who we are. It reveals our true character. What we do not realize is that mere talk without actions, without fulfillment, is costing us our characters. And that's why talk is expensive. I know our society today did not focus on characters building anymore, but I will still say this, the value of godly characters is priceless. The integrity, the honesty, the hardworking mentality, the determination in standing firm in truth only, and the list go on and on. And all these godly characters you can find, especially in the book of Proverbs, are absolutely priceless. Think again. Would you rather marry an honest person or the most handsome person on earth, but who do not fulfill his word, his vow to you? Would you rather hire, would you rather hire workers with integrity and honesty and hardworking mentality, but less ability and less capability or you would rather hire the most capable person on earth, but without honesty, without integrity. I bet you would choose those godly characters over ability and capability. Of course, it will always be best to have everything, but then if you have to choose, which one will you value more? And I bet every single thing that you would value the characters of that person sitting right next to you or in any relationship that you want to last long. People value your characters more than your ability and capability. 
God value more on your characters than what you are about to offer unto God. So Christians, keep your word. God value that. That's why He left us His word because He fulfilled every single one of them. And that's why today we can totally rely in the promise of God to be able to be accepted by God, and that we should find acceptance in His promise in our lives. After all, Jacob is the perfect example here. God accept him. Him. The one that you find all the flaws in all the chapters that we've been through. God accepted him. God blessed him. And now Jacob in this chapter find the acceptance in the promise of God. And so today we truly need to reflect upon these verses and that if you if you still did not find ways to accept yourself just as God accept you forgive yourself just as God forgive you to find the blessing and the promise of God in the Word of God in the Bible for you to receive I sincerely pray that you will start you will start living in the promise of God, living in the acceptance of the promise of God so that you finally are free in His salvation grace. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time and thank you for this chapter. With all these little details here and there, Father, we know that you love us so much and that you are always faithful and powerful to fulfill your word in our lives. So Father, I praise you and give thanks to you. And I also pray that your Holy Spirit will continue to work in our lives to help us to find the acceptance in your promise to us. Father, if we still live in the box that we built for ourselves, and I pray that your Holy Spirit will take those walls away and help us to see your truth as the foundation of our lives today. So Father, thank you for your grace and thank you for your blessings. Help us to live in you and according to your standard, and according to your promise. Father, thank you so much for everything. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.